It's an unfortunate reality that in today's day and age, there's a word that has been of comfort to many of us that has, unfortunately, to many other people, become a word associated with divisiveness or disdain, and that's religion. Ever heard the phrase of somebody when you're kind of trying to gauge where they're at in their religious practices, and they say something to the effect of, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. This is going on the rise. In fact, according to recent census data, about 28% of Americans today have no religious affiliation whatsoever. And that is a jump up from 25% just a couple of years ago and 16% in 2007. So we are on the upward trajectory. Sociologists call these folks nuns. Not the nuns like in the school, but the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people who have no religion. And they've noted that they are on the rise and that they'll continue to be. But what's interesting about this group is that they're not simply a bunch of atheists or agnostics. In fact, only a very small percentage of them would seriously say that they doubt the existence of God or the activity of the divine. No, what unites this large group of people is that they are non-religious. They might have spiritual beliefs, and many do, but they don't categorize them or organize themselves with other people based on these beliefs. Hence the phrase that's becoming more common, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Now on the one hand, I get it, absolutely. Both the sentiment behind this phrase and the rationale for it are really understandable. Lots of people have had lots of bad experience with organized religion. And not a few religious people are rather ungodly or even sometimes nasty in both their attitude and in their demeanor. So why not get rid of the bad and keep the good? Throw out the rules and the regulations and the clergy and the churches and the rituals and the ceremonies, but keep the good stuff, like the prayer and the meditation and a sense of communion with the divine. Now, as someone who, at times, has been angry with church leaders who don't seem to get it, who has felt frustrated by the rules, and who has been scandalized by the evil committed by other Christians, I get this. My guess is that you do too. And at times, I've wanted to jump ship too and go off and do my own thing. Very American, isn't it? But this is an emotional response, not a reasonable one. And I think that when we actually hold this response up to the scrutiny of good old-fashioned reasoning, it begins to make less and less sense. The spiritual, not religious, identification is based upon the assertion that spirituality and religion are actually two separate realities that may coincide, but not necessarily, or even usually. Spirituality is seen as freeing and open. Religion is seen as restricting and oppressive. Spirituality is one's private journey to God. Religion is institutional. Spirituality is otherworldly, transcendent, and mysterious. Religion is cultic and ritualistic. But is this fair? I don't think so. I think we have taken bad experiences and projected those onto what is meant by religion, but what actually results in us redefining it. Thus, what has been discarded by the sincere, but I think misguided nuns, is not necessarily, necessarily really religion, but the experience of religion. And I'd like to suggest that when you cut through all the emotions and experiences, religion and spirituality are not separate realities, but rather two sides of the same coin, and that both are absolutely necessary. I think this is what St. James is showing us in our second reading today, and what Jesus is showing us in our gospel. That spirituality without religion 
is formless and useless, and religion without spirituality is corrupt and dead. So let's unpack this a little bit. In the last lines of our second reading today, St. James says this, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word that James uses here for religion is the Greek word threskeia, which means a worship that is outwardly manifest. In the ancient world, and certainly at the time of Jesus, the worship of God required both an inward intention but an outward action. In other words, one actually had to ritualize one's worship of God. And this was done through audible prayers, singing of songs, and most importantly, the offering of sacrifices. Now if we think about this, this is extremely intuitive to us as human beings. I mean, we know in our relationships with each other that the love that we have for each other cannot be something that just exists here or exists here. It has to be displayed. It has to be manifested and acted upon. We don't just think or feel love for our wives or husbands or children or friends. We show it to them. We give them gifts every year on their birthday. That's a ritual. Right? We write them poems. We do good things for them. We tell them I love you. And we also engage in a bunch of other external rituals that show our inward love. You come into their presence, what do you do? You give them a hug. That's a ritual. A kiss before bed. It's a ritual. Christmas gifts, birthday parties, all of it. It's a ritual. It's love that is displayed and enfleshed. And if love is not this way, it becomes formless. And then there's a huge disconnect between what I say I feel and the way that I behave. And I think that's what St. James is getting at in our second reading today with the word religion. He means that the inward love that we have for God must be externalized and made visible. And because God has revealed himself not just to individuals, but to a people, in fact, to all people, these acts of love, of worship, have to be communal. It wasn't enough for someone to just escape out into the woods and worship God in his or her own. They had to do so with the community, with the people of God. This is what it means to be religious to regularly and continuously offer to God an external and enfleshed sign of our adoration and love for him, both individually and internally and with others. But we know, and this is where things get tough, we know that whenever people come together to do anything, chaos develops and division Two people. Jesus says, where two or three people are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst. But guess what? Also, controversy, right? Different ideas, different values, and different ways of looking at things require that some kind of structure has to be utilized in order to bring order and harmony to the activity that people have gathered together. Think about all the other things in reality that this requires. Road construction. There gotta be rules and regulations, otherwise you're gonna have a bad road or no road at all. A restaurant kitchen, a courtroom, the family dinner table, whatever it is, wherever people are gathered together, there's going to be required some kind of standardization. And when it comes to the public worship of God, there's no exception. God gave the law to Moses to help bring structure to the inward worship and the external worship of the people of Israel. And Christ gives us the church to do the same in our day. Religion, in a secondary sense, can be used to refer to the way that this structure is brought about. The rules, the regulations, the liturgical calendars, the hierarchy, etc. So when people say, I'm spiritual, not religious, they're usually reacting emotionally 
to something gone wrong, either perceived or actual, with religion in this secondary sense. They rightly recognize that sometimes it seems like more emphasis can be placed on the structure and the regulations of the right worship of God rather than on the deeper spiritual significance of our love for him. And this is where Jesus is speaking in our gospel today. The Pharisees, who in a sense had become obsessed with the blind observance of external worship, had forgotten that external worship must be an expression of an inward love of God. When our practice of religion is not infused with a true living love of God, then it will become corrupt and lifeless. And so Jesus beckons the scribes and Pharisees, and he beckons us as well to guard against this. I think that spirituality without religion is unhuman. And really, when you get to the heart of it, dishonest. It's about doing what I want to do, myself on my own. And religion without spirituality is hypocritical and dead and is usually about trying to control others. But when the two come together in tandem, they give rise to great wholeness, to great holiness in a person. Because the body expresses what the spirit believes, a person can offer his or her whole self to God as an offering of love. And I think that's what St. James is getting at when he talks about religion that is pure and undefiled. And precisely what Jesus is getting at when he calls out the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. We're called today to fight the temptation to regard our love for God as merely an internal reality. It must be this, but it must also be external and communal. Many times people have said to me, usually at times where they are feeling guilty and so need to justify themselves to me in some way, I don't know why, but they'll say, Father, why do I got to go to church? I can worship God in the forest or on the golf course. Yep, absolutely, you sure can. And you should be worshiping God every minute of every day wherever you are. But if we do not externalize this worship frequently and regularly and communally, then there's going to be something essential missing in our love for God. There will be no stake in it. We will get to just think about it, and we will never be able to actually live it out. And this is dangerous for us. And that's why we come here together, week after week after week. We do this together as one. And we do this for those who can't be with us. We do this for those who have gone before us. And we do this for those who will come after us. We do this together because this is what human beings are called to do. And although there are many who have fallen away from this, I am so glad that there are still people who regard this as an essential part of their lives. Your presence here, even when you're just sitting here, nobody else knows you're here, or when you're scurrying across the street to come in and cars are driving by seeing you, it's a great sign. It's a great sign that people are still in touch with their God and that they are going to worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's pray today for all of those who maybe have fallen away, or maybe those who no longer consider themselves religious or Catholic or any of those labels and are just kind of dwelling in the realm of generalized spirituality. And let's pray that the Holy Spirit touch their hearts, that they might recognize the true goodness that comes from gathering together in ritual worship of God. And let's pray that any part of our hearts that may be tempted to go off into that land will be firmly guarded against, and that we will find our joy and our salvation in this Eucharist, this gathering of thanksgiving of the people of God before their loving Savior.